Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Today, we're speaking with Matt Vickers, who is the New York-based author of Lucretia's Choice and widower of the New Zealand lawyer, Lucretia Seals. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Rebecca. Nice to be here. Um, so can you tell us, um, I mean, we're talking about um, your, your wife, Lucretia, and can you just tell us what she was like when you met her? Uh, yeah, when I met Lucretia, um, she was a uh, successful young lawyer in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, she was uh, a very intelligent woman, a very kind woman, a very caring woman. Uh, and uh, um, just uh, I, I was immediately attracted to her. We actually met at a bar on Courtney Place in Wellington uh, one night. And um, we headed off there and had a, had, a, had a conversation and I decided that I... I wanted to see her again, so uh, I gave her a, a phone call over the weekend, and she agreed to go out with me. And I did wonder whether I might have had the beer goggles on uh, when I first met her. But when um, we got together on that Monday night, the following week, um, I, I yeah was completely captivated by her and, and just how wonderful she was. Um, you know, and I was immediately attracted to her, you know, physically. But then, you know, as the conversation progressed. Um, you know, I, I, I got to know her as a person, and 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 realised that she was she was someone special. So, so uh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so I um so we began to see each other quite regularly after that. Um, at the time, she was working for a law firm in Wellington, um, doing what's called public law, which is law that's uh, sort of uh, around government relations and 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 the, and the formation of legislation, etc. And uh, so it was quite a high-powered job that she had. Uh, I was just doing uh, web design at the time, but um, we, we, we managed to uh, you know, hit it off and, 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 and had a great relationship from that point forward. So, uh, I mean, you guys were together for a while, and, and then I know you decided to um, get married. And, um, I, you know, the, at, at that point, um, so what, what happened after you were married? Uh, well, we, we got married, uh, I think, two, 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 two to three years into the relationship. Um, it was it was a, a beautiful ceremony, beautiful wedding. Um, all our friends and family were there. Uh, it was great. Um, but immediately, sort of after that, you know, my my wife, um, you know, started talking about, you know, it's time for us to have children. And so we uh, started the process of trying to have kids. Um, in New Zealand, uh, first first of all, naturally, uh, and then um, after after a while, when things weren't starting to work out for us, uh, we we went to uh, sort of have infertility treatment uh, in New Zealand, in, in Wellington, and it was a it was a long and full process. I have to say, I mean, um, you, you know, uh, uh, I'm sure some of your listeners um, have perhaps been through that process. Um, but IVF, is, it, it does take a lot out of you, um, particularly out of, I think, the, the female partner in the relationship. And um, you know, we struggled through that. I think we went through, you know, five or six or seven uh, rounds of IVF uh, attempting to conceive. Um, and we finally got to the point where the doctors decided there wasn't much that they could do uh, further um, and for us to look at egg donation. So we actually uh, got in touch with a clinic in San Diego and were beginning to look at the process of uh, um, actually having an egg donor and, um, and, and conceiving that way. Um, that was a little tough for me to deal with. I really wanted to have Lucretia's biological child because she was such an extraordinary person. Uh, but um, unfortunately, that wasn't to be. So, I mean, in that in that process, when when you were starting to um, think about doing that, were you noticing that there were some problems with Lucretia's health? Yeah, but nothing nothing that would indicate uh, what would come later. Um, only things like, uh, I guess, 
um, I mean, there were, there were fertility issues. They were unrelated to, to, to you know, the, the, the brain tumor that sort of came later on. Um, yeah, no, nothing that sort of indicated that there was any other issues. And, and so how did you find out about the brain tumor? Uh, well, we found out um, because uh, Preesh had been having headaches, um, quite serious headaches for some time. Um, and they just weren't going away. The medication that she was trying to take uh, just wasn't, um, you know, you know, uh, helping her uh, feel better. So, so um, she's kind of insisted on getting a scan. Um, the the medical system in New Zealand is a little bit different uh, than than what you might um, be used to in, in the United States or Canada. Um, there's a it's a public health system, so there was kind of a, a queue to 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 get uh, to see a specialist. It's not immediate. Um, so she she put her name down to get uh, to see a neurologist. Uh, and over the Christmas period, it was hard to sort of pin one down and hard to get an appointment. Uh, we finally did get her an appointment um, probably in March after the, after the Christmas of uh, uh, 2014, no, 2011. And um, when we went to see the neurologist, he just conducted a series of basic tests on Lucretia. So just sort of seeing, uh, sort of mapping out a field of vision, um, looking at um, her, her physical responses to, 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 to reflex activity, all those sorts of things. And he immediately thought, no, there's, there's something not, not right here. Um, so he put her in uh, to have an MRI scan the very next day. And um, so, you know, we, we sat in the car afterwards. We were terrified and, and, and upset and, and all, this, all this sort of normal stuff that you would have as you sort of go through that process of trying to understand what's going on. And then um, the next day we ended up uh, back at the hospital first thing in the morning and um, scans, she had scans, the scans came through. And um, yeah, essentially there was a, a large tumor uh, in her brain. Um, it was about six centimeters in length that was across the, the middle line of her brain. Um, it was quite diffuse, um, quite large. Um, and you know, looking at, looking at the scans on the computer screen, it was like looking at an, an alien landscape or something. It was all out of portion and, and, and had kind of pushed the center line of her brain over. And, and just to see it on that screen, um, it was kind of astonishing to me how she'd been able to cope for so long uh, with that, with that um, kind of distortion in, 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 in her brain. Um, but, you know, thinking on it now and reflecting back on some of the things that had happened prior to this diagnosis, um, suddenly little things that had happened made a lot more sense. There was one night where she was driving um, from a, uh, a cake decorating class that she was doing, and um, she ended up hitting a parked car as she was sort of coming around the corner, and the parked car was on the left-hand side of the road. Lucretia's vision, um, we later found out, she'd lost the left-hand side of her vision. So at the time, we just thought it was a funny accident, but now understanding what had happened to her brain, um, little little things like that just became much more... Um, you know, uh, obvious as to, as to why these things occurred. So, yeah, uh, that's how we found out. Um, and the, the, the upshot was that Lucretia needed to go into surgery um, pretty much immediately. Uh, she was at risk of going into coma within weeks. Um, if it hadn't been picked up, um, she almost certainly would have died at that point. Uh, so we were lucky to, to, to get the MRI when we did. We would have been far luckier if we'd done it earlier. Uh, but um, that's ultimately what happened, and then, and then uh, yeah, she sort of went into a weekend where we we got the family together and um, all sort of uh, rallied round her um, as she sort of uh, prepared herself to, to go into surgery and, and have the tumor kind of excised. So, um, what was Lucretia feeling at this point? How 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 did she take the news, and and uh, what what was going on? I, I was really surprised uh, with how strong she was. I mean, there were moments when um, she, 
uh, cried and, and collapsed in tears and, and all those sorts of things, you know, the, 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 the normal responses you would have to, to um, an emergency like that. But also, she was really heartened by the way her family gathered around her, but um, there was no, no, no way that her family wouldn't do that. Lucretia was kind of almost the center of her extended family. Um, she was the eldest of all the, the nieces. Um, she was uh, one, of the, one of the most successful members of the family with her, with her law career and so on. Um, but she was also very kind-hearted and um, loved giving gifts to people, etc. So as a natural response to that, um, her family just gathered around her and, um, to support her in, 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 in this kind of really trying time. Uh, but uh, ultimately, yeah, I, 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 she, was, she was lifted up by that, I think. She, she recorded a little video um, that weekend before she went into surgery, and she talked about how grateful she was for the life that she had, grateful for meeting me, grateful for being able to travel, grateful for having a career, grateful for having um, uh, a family, that, the family that she did. Uh, she was just extremely thankful for the, the life that she led. And, you know, she'd been given the, the risks around the surgery and they said that she may pass away or she may not make it through it because, you know, the, the, the surgery in the brain was, you know, was going to be significant, require significant surgery. But uh, as a result of uh, yeah, that, that sort of um, made her, uh, I guess, focus on, on her life at that point. And um, she just sort of felt, well, look, it's my time, it's my time, but um, I've, I've had a wonderful life so far and I'm, I'm extraordinarily grateful for it. So how, how were you feeling? I was devastated. I was devastated. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, when I married Lucretia, um, I, I thought that, that was that. I thought that we would be together forever. Um, and I thought that we would grow old and, and, and be well together and, and, and you know, live to a ripe old age. Um, and, I mean, I, I felt like I wanted to support her and to make sure that she had everything she needed uh, to get through this, this health scare. I was still hoping that she would recover and come out the end of it um, uh, restored in some way. Um, so I was dealing with that, but also just the shock of, you know, the person that I love most in my life was having to go through this, these extraordinary circumstances and uh, I, I felt helpless, um, unable to, you know, they, they, it was something I, I had this re response where I wanted to fix things somehow and it was just unfixable. Um, so all I could really do was support. Um, yeah, it was, it was a very tough time for me. So, um, Lucretia uh, did go through with the surgery, and um, how did she recover from that? Uh, so, the surgery uh, was, uh, uh, I think it was over about six hours, and, um, you know, we were sitting, waiting for her to emerge from the theater and for the doctors to tell us how the surgery had gone. Um, and thankfully, you know, the surgery was successful, uh, but, you know, she'd had a large portion of you know, her her brain or her, I think it was her parietal or occipital lobe taken out and um, the the recovery time she was in hospital must have been three or four days uh, after that uh, surgery just sort of recovering um, she kept she had her eyes closed um, the first day or so she was pretty unresponsive um, unable to walk all those sorts of things and the doctor said, well, we, you know, we, we removed as much as we could um, safely, um, but there are, there are still sections there that are remaining and uh, we'll need to deal with those parts uh, in other ways. Uh, so, but as Chris got sort of through the surgery and, um, and, and through the recovery period, you know, she decided she, her, her biggest concern was oh, look, I, I need to get back to the office. I've got work to do. <laughs> I need to um, get on with my job. And, yeah, this is, this is, this is kind of an annoying distraction, um, <laughs> which is silly, really. Um, mm -hmm. But she, she, just, she just felt a huge sense of responsibility to, to get back to her job, which she, which she loved. She did um, 
probably, you know, she talked about wanting to, as soon as she got the opportunity to stand up and start walking around, uh, she embraced that um, and was wanting to get out of the hospital as soon as she could. And she did get out um, uh, probably quicker than, than most patients would. Um, she didn't like the food there. She was a foodie, so she enjoyed uh, good, good food. And, um, uh, you know, hospitals are generally pretty good at giving you, you know, uh, what you need nutritionally. But um, perhaps they're a little lacking in uh, a bit of creativity, I guess. <laughs> Well, um, we're actually going to take a, a quick break. We'll be back, um, but we're talking today with Matt Vickers, and we're discussing his book, Lucretia's Choice. We'll be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. The largest syndicated alternative health talk program has come to the Voice America Network. The Dr. Bob Martin Show is the program that will answer your health questions and help you to heal your own body of many different ailments. Each week, you'll hear the answers that Dr. Bob gives to his callers that help them to be their own doctor most of the time. We'll also discuss developments on the health care front and what you need to do to keep your body in top form. The Dr. Bob Martin Show airs Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're speaking with Matt Vickers, who is the author of Lucretia's Choice. So, Matt, um, after Lucretia had her surgery, um, did she have any other uh, treatment for her brain tumor? Yes, she did. Um, during the surgery, of course, she she uh, did, her skull was actually pulled away in order for uh, the doctor to be able to access the brain uh, and, and, make this, and make the incisions that they needed to make. Um, but after that, her skull was stitched back up. Um, and after a period of recovery, uh, which must have been about four or five weeks, uh, she began uh, radiotherapy, where um, they essentially blasted, uh, the, blasted the parts of the brain that still had pieces of the tumor remaining um, inside her skull. Um, and that, that was pretty tough for her to go through. Um, as I was saying earlier, you know, she was a, a very beautiful woman, um, a very kind woman, um, and, and all of that remained true. Uh, but uh, she did lose her hair through that first process, and there was significant burning to her scalp um, and a lot of a lot of uh, stuff going on there, which was you know tough for her to deal with. Um, you know, she had a she had a self image that she needed to kind of recalibrate as all these changes were were taking place. Um, so the, the radiotherapy sort of occurred over about two months. And I remember one episode where um, 
we were at the hospital and they had some uh, temporary staff that were in there um, working because it was over a holiday period. And uh, her mother, uh, who was with us, um, was watching as they were lining up the radiation machine. And um, her mum, who had seen this process happen a few times, took a look and said, I, I think you've lined this up wrong. I don't think you've got this right. And the two staff there were like, no, no, we've got it right. We absolutely have it right. But of course, um, you know, after they, they went through that process and, and, and uh, Lucretia came out and she said, Mum, I don't, I don't think that they did that like they should have. That felt different that time. And um, Lucretia's mum was, of course, furious at, at, at this. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty fraught process to go through that, that radiotherapy. It's, it's very precise and particular and, um, you know, extremely damaging to, to, to brain cells, et cetera. But, uh, that that was very tough. So, um, how did how did her disease progress over time after that treatment and after the surgery? Uh, well, after radiotherapy, immediately after radiotherapy, um, she was very uh, exhausted, um, just completely wiped out, and it took probably two two months, I think, before she was in a position where she was able to, to, to sort of feel normal, feel normal again. Um, but when she reached that point, the first thing she wanted to do was to go back to work. Um, so she organised with her employer uh, to go back to, to, to the Law Commission where she worked. And she worked because she wanted to work there full time. Um, but after a while, it was clear that, you know, she was getting exhausted in the afternoon. She needed to cut that back down to you know, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. But she would go there by herself. She would, she, I would, um, she would get the bus uh, into town and and go to go to work and then um, take take the bus home. Um, I was working full time as well, um, of course. So uh, the two of us kind of needed to rely on each other to be able to do those things together. I, I would have liked to have just taken taken the rest of work off and 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 for her to take it off and for us just to be able to spend time together, but bills to pay and all those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, but, yeah, go ahead. But uh, over time, her the, the radiotherapy kind of created a, a kind of a peak of um, recovery where she was doing pretty well. But then after, I think, maybe a year, maybe, maybe two years, um, she started to deteriorate again. And there were things like um, a, a kind of a creeping paralysis that was happening in the left-hand side of her body where she couldn't move um, her, her arm or leg very well. They were very, very stiff. Um, and the, the thing where her vision, the half, half of the field of vision was completely not there. I mean, that was consistent all the way through. Uh, and, and then she was just sort of dealing with a general kind of tiredness. Um, but as soon as those systems kind of those those symptoms kind of ramped up, we kind of had to go back to the doctor and say, "Well, okay, what's next? What can you do for us now?" So, um, did Lucretia ever have a look at her own mortality and and make some decisions for herself of what would happen if she didn't survive? Um, not at that point. Uh, no, she was very much focused on living. Very much okay. focused on. Um, um, you know, being around for years and years, and um, she had—I mean, we wrote a list together of, of things to look forward to. So we wanted to go on holidays together. We wanted to um, uh, go on cruises together and experience life together. So we kind of planned those things out. And also, her mother um, was due to have a 60th birthday in I think 2000 and 2016. Uh, and she wanted to be around for that. She wanted to be there for her mother's 60th birthday and be able to sort of um, give a speech at that birthday and talk about um, how much she loved her mum and how much she cared for her and, and, and all those things. So she was always she was always focused on, on getting better and getting well and doing everything that she could to make sure um, that she had the best chance of recovery. She, she, she didn't drink. Um, she ate extremely healthily. Um, she she did everything right. She she went to the gym as, as far as she could. 
um, just to, to keep her fitness and her wellness up um, so that she it was in the best possible condition for dealing with the cancer that she had. And um, so when, when was it that she got involved in her work with, um, you know, a doctor-assisted death and dying with dignity? Well, that came after um, a couple of rounds of chemotherapy. So um, after she started to deteriorate um, through radiotherapy, uh, or the, the radiotherapy had no longer worked, um, she switched to... Um, a chemotherapy and that worked for about a year um, but then that dropped back uh, and and then finally you know we went to the doctor and we sat down with them and they said um, look we've, we've run out of we've run out of things that we can actually do here we don't have any further good options for you right now you need to start thinking about palliative care um, you need to start thinking you know start to talk to the hospice and you know when we start when we had that conversation I think that was the first time Lucretia realized well Maybe, maybe I am not going to make it. Maybe I am. Um, you know, maybe I do have to deal with my mortality, etc. Um, and she began to sort of think about that. And the thing for her was that the the prognosis was that she may lose some of her mental faculties. She may get into a situation where she wasn't able to be able to recognise um, family members. Um, she may um, experience pain. Um, as the brain swelled and kind of pushed back down into her brainstem, all those sorts of things. And she was this extremely independent-minded person, and for her, um, the fact that cancer was kind of getting to choose how and when she would die um, just didn't seem right to her. It uh, didn't seem fair, uh, and she began to sort of think, well, okay, um, what I want is a choice about how I die. I'm probably going to die, but I want to be able to choose how that happens and when that happens. Um, so she didn't want to die. I mean, that, I, I have to make that 100% clear. She wanted to live for as long as she could live for, but given that she was going to, and it was, you know, her, she, her, her illness was terminal, she decided, no, if, I'm, if my illness is terminal, I want to say in how and when that happens. Um, and then uh, she began to examine the law around that and realised that the law in New Zealand didn't support that choice. Um, that um, the, the law essentially said that uh, having someone help her to take her life at a time of her choosing um, was essentially illegal. So, um, I, I, I guess there's a, there's a few questions about that because there's... Um, not everybody may understand um, ju- just what you said, and and um, you know it took me reading your book as well to fully understand what Lucretia w- was asking for, and um, you know some people may consider what she was asking for to be suicide, but I think that there was a a, a great difference between that and seeking help to die. But can you just uh, explain that to us? Yeah, I, I think there is a big difference too. Um, in the example of someone who um, has has uh, suicidal thoughts, I think you know what we're talking about there is someone with a mental um, a mental illness or a mental condition where they um, are not rational and they are essentially choosing an action um, in, to, to shorten their life. Um, whereas if they were of rational minds, um, they, they would not. Uh, and I think that, you know, we, we need to be very careful um, at distinguishing between that and a situation where we're talking about a terminally ill person who is dying um, because of their physical condition and where they might want to make a rational decision around choosing between uh, one particular kind of death, which might be slow and painful, versus one that is... Um, Uh, under their control and and briefer and um, and so on. Um, There's an analogy that um, a Christian writer actually um, wrote, and I think it was published in Time, where he talked about um, the circumstances of 9-11 and where how some of the people in 9-11 were in in one of the Twin Towers in the World Trade Center. And essentially, the building was on fire 
and these these poor people had a, an awful, awful choice. Um, the choice on one hand was to burn to death in the fire, or on the other hand, to jump out of the building. Um, and, you know, an awful, awful place for anyone to be. Um, you know, I, I live down the road from the, from the World Trade Center now, and, um, you know, I, I pass it um, fairly, fairly often, and uh, my thoughts, you know, go out to those people um, constantly. Uh, but, but I guess um, the metaphor that I'm trying to paint here is that, in a way, someone with a terminal illness is like someone in that burning building. Um, they essentially have two horrible choices. Um, but to sort of say that they can't choose between those two things, to say, well, you have to perish in the fire, otherwise it's suicide, um, I think that's the wrong thing to do. And certainly, you know, when those when those poor people jumped from the building uh, and, and leapt to their deaths rather than burn in the flames, um, the New York chief medical examiner essentially said that those people were not suicides, even though they had taken an act um, to end their lives uh, actively rather than passively perishing in the flames. Um, and I think that's the difference. I, I, yeah, uh, as, a, as a person with a terminal illness, you're not choosing to die, you're choosing how it happens. Well, you and know, I think that makes a difference from suicide. Yeah, when I when I was reading your your book, and I was thinking about some of the people that I've lost in my life, and you know, you you sit with them at a hospice, and and um, their body starts to shut down, and they don't eat and they don't drink, and and you don't know if it's you know the cancer that's taking them or the fact that they're you know starving and dehydrated, and um, having the the thought of if you know could have saved a, a month of pain and have them have a choice and be able to say goodbye in a proper way when they're still still able to speak and and not go through all that extra pain at the end um you know i'd never thought of that before and um and it does seem um more compassionate to me to to at least have that choice to um not extend that that suffering uh, for so long when I mean it's hard to watch somebody go through that and it's hard for them to go through that as well and and um, I think that's what Lucretia, Lucretia was was wanting was was not to put herself and you through through all of that yeah I think that's true and and I think um, an important thing to say here is that it, it really needs to be you know the individual themselves that chooses and uh, you know, I would not advocate and, and would never advocate for a situation where um, someone says, well, you're sick. Um, I, I think, you know, rather than suffer, we're going to end your life for you. I think that's a, I think that's immoral and, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, incredibly repugnant, really. Mm -hmm. um, but if an individual, a patient um, of their own free will and through their own rationality says, um, look, I would rather pass away than, than, than go through um, the, the final stages of my illness. Um, and that is, con and that is um, consistent with my moral beliefs. Then I think, um, you know, a, a doctor or, or a doctor should be able to assist that person to end their lives at a time of their choosing. And I think the, the, the point about morality here is that there is, you know, some people believe that there is an absolute morality and that, um, you know, no matter how you look at it, there's a situation, thou shalt not kill, I mean, it's in the Bible. Um, and but there, there are others who um, don't share that moral view, that, that there are shades of grey, I mean, um, and, and clearly there are. I mean, we, we talk about thou shalt not kill, but then there are, um, you know, we still send people off to war to, to, to fight and to kill people. Um, we still, um, you know, uh, put down our pets. Um, we still, uh, there, there are exceptions to this rule, and we still withdraw medical treatment from people. So we mm -hmm. might, they might be in a life support machine, and we might switch that off. So there are shades of grey, and I think that the important thing here is that a person is able to take um, or perform an act that is consistent with their own moral framework. So if they don't believe that assisted dying is, is moral, um, then um, you know it shouldn't even come up for discussion. Uh, they should they should be able to um, die in their own way. And certainly, you know, Christian belief and, and, and Catholic belief in particular is that suffering is redemptive. 
Uh, and, you know, I, I personally don't agree with that belief, but I am more than, you know, if, 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 if a Catholic person believes that, then, then so, so be it. Um, they should be free to die their own way. But um, perhaps another person sort of says, well, you know, suffering is meaningless. So if suffering is meaningless, why should I have to go through that process rather than um, die in a way that's consistent with my own moral worldview? Uh, that's, that's, I think, the, the difference there. Well, and I think that that part there is a is a personal choice of the suffering or the the not suffering. Um, you know, it, it's the um, what we're dealing with here is is the um, ending the life earlier, which I, I think is the argument. Um, we're going to uh, come back and uh, talk about that after the break. We are going to take a quick break. We're talking to Matt Vickers um, about his book, Lucretia's Choice. We'll be back shortly. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. Take us on the go. It's even easier now. The Voice America Talk Radio Network has launched our mobile app for iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry. Visit the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market to download the app powered by Aircast. It's free and no registration is necessary. In minutes, you could be enjoying your favorite Voice America Talk Radio host, no matter where you are, in the car, out and about, while traveling, or anytime you can't be close to your computer. Catch up on the archives you've missed or discover new shows on the spot. Search Voice America at your favorite app store. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Riss. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today we're uh, speaking with Matt Vickers, and we're discussing his book, Lucretia's Choice. So, Matt, when when Lucretia was, um, you know, uh, making some decisions for herself, and, 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 you know, we spoke earlier that she realized the law wasn't there for her to be able to make her own decision about um, when her life was going to end and, and how, um, you know, what what did she do about that? Well, uh, when she figured out the law wasn't going to support her in being able to have a choice about how she died, um, she decided that uh, the right thing to do was actually to challenge that law. And in order to do that, she she essentially um, raised a a statement of claim and um, sued the New Zealand government and said, I should be able to have um, this right and this choice. And she asked um, the government to clarify um, the law, particularly around um, what they mean by suicide, but also to um, examine uh, what qualifies as murder and with a, a, a doctor assisting her um, to be able to be assisted to die um, or not being able to do that was actually a, a breach of her human rights. New Zealand has a Bill of Rights Act um, and it's, it's drafted off the, um, the United Nations uh, uh, sort of Charter of Human Rights, I think. And, um, and so she was sort of saying, if I don't have this right, then, then that's a, a breach of my rights as a human being. Um, and then the law, and, the, the law and, and those rights become inconsistent, and therefore the law needs to be changed. So that was her, uh, that was her sort of game plan. And so she decided to to um, draw on her experience as a public lawyer in New Zealand to actually, I guess, fight the government on this issue. So um, during during that trial, I mean, there was um, arguments on on both sides. So, so what what happened? Well, uh, essentially, as soon as she put in the statement of claim, um, it suddenly became a big deal 
in New Zealand. Um, Lucretia was appearing on um, the news, uh, talking about her uh, her beliefs and why she wanted this choice. Uh, but there was still probably three or four months before the trial itself. Uh, so um, during that time, I, I, she she did start to go downhill uh, fairly rapidly, and had to finally finish her work at the Law Commission after you know the nine years or so that she'd been there. Uh, and then, uh, essentially, the trial day came up, um, and by that time, she had got to a condition where she was now in a wheelchair, uh, and she, she needed to be wheeled into the courtroom um, to to essentially listen to the lawyers argue. She wasn't representing herself. She'd hired some friends of hers um, who were good friends, but, but also tremendous human rights lawyers. Uh, to essentially argue her case for her. And um, this sort of played out in the New Zealand High Court over a period of about three days. Um, she had her lawyer sort of present her case, the fact that she was rational, uh, reasonable, and of sound mind, that she was making this decision um, or wanting to have this choice with the full consent of the ram- full full uh, appreciation of the understanding of the ramifications of what she was after, and that it was not moral for the law to restrict her from being able to ask her doctor to help her be assisted to die. And her doctor had essentially signed an affidavit that stated that should it be legal or should the court decide that she should be allowed to do this, that that doctor would willingly assist Lucretia um, should she want to take take that up. Um, as I said, the court case lasted three days and uh, after the th- third day, um, the judge, uh, Justice Collins, essentially thank Lucretia for bringing this important issue to the courtroom of New Zealand to actually test the law. And um, then, um, yeah, we went home. Uh, uh, I remember that night um, on the third day, uh, driving driving back through Wellington, um, past um, a, a bank of like uh, journalists with cameras and so on, and going back home to sit in front of the television and, and watch the six o'clock news where they, all they were talking about was this case. It was very, very surreal. Um, within two days after that, uh, Lucretia got to the point where she was unable to sort of sit properly. Um, and so she was actually moved into a, a bed, which we had sort of got from the hospital and brought home. And she went and lay in that bed in the lounge. And I was there with her family, her, her mother and father and, and her two siblings. And... um. Yeah, we, we just sort of sat there and watched watched the, the news unfold over the following week. Um, and then finally, um, Justice Collins delivered his first judgment, um, an interim judgment, which wasn't successful. I read that to Lucretia, and um, at that point she wasn't really communicating. Uh, she just sort of looked at me, and I could see that she was upset by the decision, um, but unable to sort of um, express uh, through words how she was feeling. And then um, a couple of days later, uh, he we received the final judgment, and um, it was embargoed for about 24 hours. So we received it 24 hours before the journalist did. And I read that to her um, probably at eight o'clock in the evening, uh, and she was um, uh, in that at that point uh, very, very, very weak. Um, but uh, I. I think she could understand. I don't really know. Um, later that night, um, she passed away um, via natural causes, um, just uh, with the chain stoke breathing and, and, and so on, and, and, and just essentially uh, passed away over the course of, I, I guess, an hour and a half. Um, and she was with my, uh, her father and, and her mother and I. Uh, and then, um, uh, essentially, I had to respond to the judgment on Lucretia's behalf, um, essentially write a statement and um, deliver that to the media the next day. Um, Yeah, I remember um, three o'clock in the morning I was writing a a media statement where, you know, essentially that Lucretia had passed away, sent that out to the media, um, and then of course in the morning on television, you know, Lucretia Seals has passed away. through all the news networks, etc. It was it was a very strange time. 
Um, but yeah, I, I remember standing up in front of that media scrum at, later that afternoon and essentially saying that she hadn't been successful in that in that action. The judge had ruled against her. Um, in reading the judgment, I, I felt like the judge wanted to rule in her favour, but felt that he couldn't um, because he felt that if he would to rule in her favour, he would be changing the law as written. But that there was a, a tone in that judgment that suggested that the law should be changed, um, should be different, because Lucretia was um, rational and sound mind and all those things. Uh, and as a result of that, actually, um, there has been a lot of action politically in New Zealand uh, to get this, get the law changed so that Lucretia could have had that choice. Um, and others like her in the future will be able to have that choice. And, and, and that's the hope now, is that um, we will have a, a law change that essentially gives people um, that choice at the end of their lives, should they want it. So when when a law like this gets passed, I know some people have a fear that, you know, it, it's going to kind of be taken advantage of. Um, are there certain parameters that would be set in place to make sure, I mean, you keep saying Lucretia was of sound mind. Is that something that that's really important when we when a decision like this is made? Yes, it is. Um, but the thing is that this law is, is not a new idea. Um, it is, it is uh, that the whole idea of assisted dying is actually uh, legal in a few countries now. So um, Canada introduced yeah. um, assisted dying laws, uh, I think, uh, last year, uh, and they've been rolled out. Um, the states, uh, particular states in the United States of America, have had these laws for a while. Um, of course, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg have all had them. Uh, Colombia, um, surprisingly, as a you know deeply Catholic country, also has um, assisted dying uh, legislation. So. I guess New Zealand's kind of out on its own. Um, actually, in Australia, only I think last week, um, law was passed in the state, or law was sort of approved in the state of Victoria, allowing for assisted dying there. So there is this kind of uh, uh, change that's, that's gradually happening where this, 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 this is being legalised, but it's been New Zealand, if it were to put these laws in place, could learn from all those examples and choose the laws that are, that are most appropriate for that society um, to learn from what's happening in Canada, to learn from what's happening in, um, in, in the US, etc. Uh, the US in particular has um, extremely strict laws uh, around um, who can access it to dying. A person must be terminally ill. Um, they must be mentally competent. Um, they need to be examined by two doctors. If there are psychological issues in play, they must see a psychiatrist. All these things are you know, in there as safeguards. And uh, there have been no, um, uh, as far as I can tell, no provable instances of abuse of the, the laws in Oregon, for example, um, neither in Canada. Um, but I mean, this is just, uh, it's, it's just a way for a person to be able to um, shorten their life if, if they feel as though the quality of their life gets to a point that they will have to suffer uh, to reach the end of it. Um, the laws in Oregon, for example, have not changed in 20 years since they've been introduced. Some people argue that, you know, the, the scope will gradually increase. Well, that hasn't happened in Oregon. Um, it's true that in the Netherlands and, and Belgium, they have expanded the scope of those laws, but they've done, they've done that very carefully and after a lot of consideration. And only when they've been comfortable that the laws in place uh, are... are being used safely and, and there are systems of oversight that sort of examine uh, the details of cases and make sure that um, the laws aren't being abused. So there are ways and means and I, I think it's, it's, it's kind of uh, pessimistic or um, uh, you know, distrustful to assume that if these laws are there that, that they're automatically going to be abused. Well, so I, I mean... 
some examples that you had in your book, you know, when a, a doctor is is assisting and helping make those decisions, they're not just making that lightly. It's a it's a very serious situation, and um and and I can imagine it's hard on them as well to to be part of this. I mean, it's hard even just if if a patient's gonna gonna die, um, let alone be parting be part of that situation. So, um, you know, I. I, I would find it hard to think that it, it would be abused, but I know that that was some of the argument that, you know, now there's going to be an increase when when the parameters are set that it's, you know, people with a terminal illness um, anyway. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, doctors are essentially, they're, they're incredible people that have decided that they want to just spend their lives helping people. And they go to medical school um, and learn um, how, how to heal and, and so on, um, and because they're very uh, selfless human beings, they they, they want to help people. And when someone comes to them and says, um, "You know, I I, I don't want to suffer. I want I want a way out." Um, the doctor's response is not going to be, um, "I'd love to help you with that." <laughs> the doctor's <laughs> response is going to be, um, "Look, let's look at all your other options first. Let's see if there's some way that we can we can deal with the pain or." What's underlying? What's underlying the request that you've got? You know, what? What? what are, why are you asking for this? Um, that is generally the response. Now, um, I've I've seen a few interviews with doctors in Oregon who have um, been in a situation where they have um, provided a prescription for a, for a patient, and the and the doctors in those situations are never it's never the the first choice. It's always the last resort, and it's always driven by a consistently held request by the patient. The patient absolutely has to want it absolutely almost has to convince the doctor that they've looked at all other options and discarded them before before that doctor will help them. And of course, um, there is conscientious objection, um, I think both in Canada and in the, in, in the United States, where the doctor doesn't want to do this, doesn't feel that they can do this, feels that it's um, in, in conflict with their own personal morality, they don't have to do it. Um, they're, they're expected to be able to refer a patient to a doctor that may assist them, but um, that's their choice too. And I think, I think consent, you know, is, is, is an incredibly big part of this. Um, you need consent from the patient themselves. Um, you know, active consent that you know they actually you know, they need to almost fight for this right um, with with their with their medical um, care team. And then, but you need to have the medical care team willingly participate. Um, because they've been so convinced by the patient's wish that they can see that that is that by giving them that they're, they're actually respecting that patient's wishes. Um, so we're we're going to have to end the show. Um, I, I I mean I find this topic very interesting and and um, in, in reading your book it, it brought um, some thoughts that I hadn't ever considered before. So I I think it's important for everybody to look at this. I mean in Canada, um, I'm in Canada and uh, that's a very uh, recent um, change here. And I think it's important that we all understand what it means for us um, and our families and and just that 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 right is there um so if anybody wants more information how can they go about getting in contact with you or finding more information on this topic uh they can uh lucretia has actually had has a website um it's lucretia.org l-e-c-r-e-t-i-a.org um that was a blog that i kept um through the course of lucretia's illness but it has information there about the case uh, and also the, the the book, Lucretia's Choice, which I wrote. Um, that's probably the first place to start. Um, and and um, also, I mean, there are groups both in the United States and in Canada and elsewhere uh, within countries that, that are very much involved in this. So in, in um, the U.S., it's Compassion and Choices. Um, I'm afraid I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with the organization in, in Canada, but I'm sure it's you know, Death with Dignity or Dying with Dignity, et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you can get in touch with them and um, and learn more about these issues and visit their websites and see what they have to say. But um, it, it is a fascinating area, and I think it's one that we'll be considering a lot more. Um, you know, as we as we go into the future. Well, thank you, Matt, for uh, joining me today and um, and discussing the, this topic and um, Lucretia as well. Um, thank you so much. 
Oh, it's a pleasure, Rebecca. Thank you for having me. And I want to thank everybody for listening. Just be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week. Thank you.